Okay, the majority, 40 out of 49, um, correct, did the right um, selection. Uh, it's a voltage source, so it starts with a capacitor, all right? The six, those six who did A, um, I suggest you guys go back to the textbook and see that it very specifically says in the beginning of the filter design with the insertion loss method, that when your source is in the form of the thevenin equivalent, so voltage source, it starts with the capacitor. If it's the um, uh, current equivalent, it starts with an inductor. In three stages, if you start with a capacitor, you're gonna have one capacitor, one inductor at the center, another capacitor at the end. Okay, so two capacitors, one inductor, as opposed to the opposite, which is in A. Two students did all of the above, which is incorrect. You cannot have three capacitors only or three inductors and have a, pro a maximally flat filter. Yes. I thought the Kuroda identities said you could transform an inductor to a capacitor. Um, not if you have not um, for high pass. I just thought it was in any case. You cannot, um, unless you start incorporating trans transmission lines, you cannot do that. At least we have not seen it in what we have done. All right, I'm not talking about other sections of the book. I don't know, I, I'm not, you know, we have not covered all the filters, but the material we have covered. I just wanted to show, to tell you that for the material we have covered, the, um, the equivalent um, source, um, like the equivalent, it's Thevenin or not Norton, will change the order of your elements. Is that, um, do I miss something? The Karoda transformations, yes. They can change an inductor to a capacitor, but they introduce sections of lines in there. So you have to have transmission lines also incorporated. Um, Dr. Chikite? Yes. Um, does the, um, whether you start with an inductor or capacitor, um, does that only depend on the source or does that also depend on whether you're doing a maximum flat or equal ripple? In, uh, for the prototype, um, it depends on the source and I will tell you why because um, it's uh, the, the G values, all right? They give you a value for, the first one is always an, an impedance value. And then, so let me, let me tell you one second, I will do the following so we can talk about this in more, in better, better. So let me just do the following here. If you bear with me for a moment. I will get the book that I have in front of all of us and then discuss it. Okay, so here it is. I was, I've been looking into it. All right, so this is our book. I have it electronically. Let me see. All right. Um, all right. You see these two. Um, we always in when we are in the, this is what we are referring to. There are two important issues that you need to remember because the values we get um, will specify of whether we have an inductance excuse me, conductance or a resistance, both at the source or at the, at the load. And the source we always select, all right? So when the source is given like this, then we always start with a capacitor. This is the rules we are using. Now, 
Let me also say that I'm sure in design, you will see all kinds of different filters. They start with all kinds of different ways. Um, and then people follow totally different types of designs. And if you uh, go and then uh, work in industry, you will see that industry has its own design tools for filters with are very, very, very uh, specific to the types of filters that industry wants to design. So, uh, and you could probably see everything uh, different, totally different from what we say. However, for this particular approach that we are using here, um, we need to follow what uh, the, the, the process because the tables we have available to us have been very specifically designed for those kinds of constraints. And the other constraint that is also important is this one that I have in front of you that says that G0 is a generator resistance or conductance, obviously. Resistance in the seven in conductance in the north nodes. But then there is another important one which you don't see in all filters, but only in the equal repo. Look at the last element. The last element here, and I don't, you don't see my, um, what I'm, I'm doing um, unless I can, but it, I will not try to uh, mess up right now. But um, the, the, the last element is the G at the end, is the G sub N plus one. N is the number, indicates the number of stages. N plus one is the last element you see. And very specifically here, it says the G N plus one, look at it, it's a load resistance when G N is a shunt capacitor, the last, the last one is a capacitor. It's a load conductance if G N is a series inductor. Now you can say when I have ones as values of Gn plus one, it does not matter. And I agree with you because if your if your um, if Gn plus one represents a load resistance and is one, the inverse of this is going to still be one. All right. So you can still call, call it an, a conductance or a resistance. However, if you go to maximally flat, Look at the maximally flat at the last element. It changes. So if you go to stage three of maximum, or excuse me, of equal or equal, if you go to stage three for the 0.5 dB ripple, you see stage three, three uh, two stages, excuse me, two stages, last element. So G sub three, but N equals two. Look at N equals two and the last element. G sub three has the value of 1.9, but G sub three is going to be what? According to this here, according to this, G sub three is gonna be a resistance if the last element is a capacitor. So the 1.9, uh, you will have to multiply it by after you, when you do an impedance transformation, you will have to multiply it by 50, all right? And if it's a conductance, what do you do? You divide it by 50. So in the case where your last, your last element, Gn plus one, is a um, resistance and the value of Gn plus one is not one, then if it were to be a conductance, it would have been a different value. Okay, so looking at this specifically for the equal ripple is very important to keep this in mind. All right, so that's what I wanted to, to show you. Any questions? now on, on those before we continue today or any other comments? Okay, I will assign it as a review so you can see it. So now we are going to continue with filters specifically with the realization 
we started to do it with Caroda transformations, all right? So we started last time, and please stop me if um, you have any questions about this. Last time, um, we decided to do Caroda transformation in a simple filter that has only two stages, one capacitor and one inductor. And these are the values, it was a maximally flat and it satisfies everything that you see here in the box. Um, and then what we do is that we applied, if we were to develop a low pass filter, all right? A low pass filter would need to go from the G values, obviously, um, to a realizable filter. So we have to apply two transformations. And the two transformations are here, impedance and frequency transformation to make it a low pass. And indeed, when you apply these two transformations, you create this low pass filter. Okay, so now we have that filter. And now we say, mm, we don't necessarily want a low pass filter. Somebody comes and tells you now, do a, a similar kind of a filter, but I want it to be, um, what did I say, band pass. And they give you a particular delta. Well, you know, they give you the, well, they don't give you a particular delta, but they will give you a particular frequency and they will give you a particular bandwidth. And then for that, we saw in the past that you were able to apply these transformations. All right, you remember those transformations? Where um, we changed the, each of the element into a combination of L and C. And we stopped there, okay? So now we said, okay, we created a um, bandpass filter, you could do it you could do exactly the same to this filter here. For this filter to be a band pass, you would have to change C by an LC in parallel and L by an LC in series. So instead of two elements here, you would go to four. All right, we saw that. Now we go back and say, okay, now let's try to do something different. We still wanna stick with the low pass, but now for the low pass, I want you to materialize it using microstrip, using transmission lines. I don't want you to create a capacitor and an inductor with whatever frequency, you know, up, up, uh, like lumped elements. Somebody's gonna tell you, it's, it's, we just don't have the particulars to do it. Uh, it might be that, you are in low frequency, so your inductor will have to be a coil. How are you gonna do coils? You know, in one gigahertz, you may have, the capacitor is gonna have, if you materialize it with transmission lines, you may have a lot of parasitics. So um, they come and tell you, um, I mean, with, with microstrip, I mean, alone you do a, what I meant to realize the inductor is a, is a uh, spiral inductor, the way we saw them. You remember we saw a lot of parasitics in the spiral and that spiral inductor, it was in a CMOS substrate where everything is very small. Could you imagine now a spiral inductor on with large inductance value on a regular microstrip? It's gonna be a huge inductor. And it's, so the whole circuit is gonna be dominated by the inductor. And not only that, it's gonna have a lot of parasitic capacitance. So then people say, okay, I don't want passives in lumped form because the, the parasitics are so high and they're not gonna perform well in, uh, over a, a large bandwidth. Okay, then they tell you, you decide to go and use transmission lines. That means that we will have to replace L and C with transmission line elements that have the same kind of performance. But we just don't do it simply like that. There are a number of transformations that you um, 
have seen in the book. And those transformations are here for you. And for these transformations, you can see, look on the left. Practically, in this transformation, this particular one, you have a sun capacitor here. And um, you would like to change this capacitor into an inductor for whatever reason. So you will have two mats to bring this capacitor next to a transmission line to find a transmission line. And then from there, you can um, replace this combination of sun capacitor with a Z0, with, with Z1, which is transmission line to another transmission line on the left and an equivalent inductor on the right. So practically by doing that, if you have a section of transmission line next to your element, then indeed, like your colleague said earlier, you can change one capacitor to an inductor or you can change an inductor to a capacitor. This is very useful, obviously. And the first ones are the ones we have seen in low pass filters, all right? A, a shunt C and a series L. But the other two also help if we have a shunt L. And then in this particular case, it gets a little more complex because then we are including transformers. And we have not talked about this. How do you do a transformer in microstrip? But very briefly, I will tell you at the end of this chapter how to do that. So we are gonna stay away from the last two and we are gonna work with the first two. So we are gonna, for now, stay away from this. And we are going to focus here on these two. And as a matter of fact, as an example, in our case, um, you, we are going to practically work on the second, okay? So now keep that in mind, we go back to our problem, all right? You need to keep in mind how you change an inductor to a capacitor and how do you, Z1, what is Z1? If you have an inductor, what will Z1 be? Can somebody tell me? What is the equivalence impedance to an inductor? If I knew the inductor value, what will be the equivalence impedance? J, J omega L. Yes, and without the J, I would say, because you will see, we don't use the J in this, it's gonna be omega, I will put the J here, but I will put omega L1. And which omega is that? Obviously, since we do it at one frequency, for a low pass, it's gonna be the cutoff frequency. For a band pass, we're gonna work at the center frequency, the design frequency, all right? For low pass, our design frequency is the cutoff. That's where we set all of the dimensions and the whole thing. And of course, we operate it below that for a low pass or a high pass above this, but omega sub C is our design frequency. But for a band pass is the center frequency. And around it, we have the bandwidth for a band pass. Okay, so it's this. Um, what is it going to be Z2 then? So Z1 here is without the J. Just because of you will see the formulas, all right? You see that you have Z2 over Z1. And then square is a real number here. So um, Z1 is without the J. And how much will be Z2 above in the capacitor case? How much is it to here? Omega C. Exactly, omega C, omega sub C, C. Okay? So in this one, you need to remember, let me now erase this part, that your N square, let's take it in our case, all right? In our case, we are down here. Our N square, is one plus Z2 
Z2 is the transmission line characteristic impedance. So, and this is Z0, I will call that Z0, over Z1, which is omega sub C L1. Okay, let me rewrite it a little bit more. It does not look good. So N squared here is um, one plus Z naught over omega sub C L1. So if you have a section of a line and it says here, all sections of lines are how long? Lambda sub C over eight, the ones that you add. That's why these uh, formulas have been developed with the assumption that this transmission line is lambda sub C over eight, okay? All right, so then you translate it to this one where now this is lambda sub C over eight. And that is the other transmission line. Let me call that like this on the second side. And then here you have a capacitance, all right? And omega sub C, C is according to that N square Z2. All right, you see those? How do I write those express? How I write those expressions? Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Now we will take this and go down to our case. So our case has a shunt C series S, series L. What do I need to do? And I have two transmission lines: one on the left, one on the right. And you see that I have made them extended without any specific length. That means that I have enough line there. I can extend the line as much as I wish around this filter. So what do I do? I take one part of this line, which is lambda C over eight. I take it like this. And then I leave the rest of the line, which is also Z naught, okay? You see that? I have not changed anything because these two sections both have Z naught. And therefore I see here the same impedance, which is Z naught as I see here. So, adding a section of a line has not really changed my filter performance, none. Do you agree with that or, or you want me to explain more? Okay, I don't hear any qu qu questions. Now I will take this one and I will, this one I will keep it here, I will, call it Z2. So it's this one here. It's this one. That I call it Z2 is nothing else but my lambda C over eight transmission line. Lambda C, uh, excuse me, over eight, exactly. That is Z2. And then I apply the formulas that I showed you previously, and I, I explain here what I have. I have uh, practically what I did, I changed the length of the transmission line, and instead of this one here, now what do I have? Let me add one page. What I have here, so I went, from this one and that was connected to one eighth of a line. I went from this to this one, where I go now to a new line, one still one eighth at the cutoff frequency.
has a different impedance. If I call this Z1, this is gonna be Z02, just to remember. And this one has a capacitance C. A new capacitance, let's call that C2. And these are given by the following relationships. So N squared of Z01, it's equal to Z02. And my capacitance C2 omega, say sub C, C2 equals N squared Z2. Rather than, mm, I'm, I'm sorry, lot wrong in this one. It should be this one. And how do I see the wrong? From, you cannot equate, um, so I will have to correct this one if I did anything. Let me see. Yes, I should have seen this here. You can, I cannot do this. This is so wrong. I cannot do this. Why is that? Because I have an impedance here. It may not, it, it's an impedance. You cannot make that equal to omega sub C, C. So practically the way it shows there, if I read it carefully, is going to be the following. We'll correct it here. It's gonna be omega, omega sub C, C equals one over N squared Z2. That's a correct, okay? And then we're gonna put this here. And I found it because you cannot make Z2, even if they're simple numbers, equal to an omega C. So it's gonna be practically one over omega sub C, C2 equal to that. All right, so we got that. What is how much is n squared? n squared equals one plus, what did I say, z2 over z1. If I remember well, don't remember all of this by heart. Let me see. Is z1 over, z2 over z1, correct, n squared. So practically, I'm going here and I will have to find that ratio. For our case, this ratio is equal, how much is Z2? You remember? Z2 is 50 ohms, Z0. And Z1 is omega, sub C L. So if I put here, this is one plus omega, uh, let me see again, Z2, which is Z naught, Z naught divided by omega sub C L. And that's the value of N squared. And for our case, for our values, this value of n squared came out to be 3.36, okay? So, um, there is one more thing here. So now what we've done before I go down here, what I have done is the following. I have changed my in, inductor to capacitor. And now what I have here is to show it better. I have a, trans, a, a, a an in, incoming transmission line, which I had from the beginning to my filter, which is 50 ohms. Then I have the first capacitor, C1. Then I have another section of a transmission line with different characteristic impedance now, all right, which however is L sub C over eight. And then I have another capacitor, C2. And then I have another section of a transmission line, which is the, the output transmission line, all right? So that's practically what I have. 
That's what I've done. Why was that important? First of all, if I were to replace both my capacitor and the inductor with uh, stubs, the capacitor with the shunt and the inductor with the series, I would have two problems. One, that it would be difficult to do a series stub for a microstrip. Two, that I cannot have one stub next to the other. I mean, it's very difficult for a layout to do that. Okay, so now I was able to change. As you can see here, both uh, in fact up here, because here we got our original circuit to this one. Any questions so far before I go to the next? Is having two stubs next to each other just like a physical limitation? Just like there's not a Yes, space? there are okay. all kinds of layout problems when you do that. Um, if, for example, you put them one across from each other, so let's assume, all right, let's assume that you want to put two stubs on a microstrip. Um, let me do it this way. I will put one stub, I want it, let's assume they cut the, the um, let's assume that I have um, to put a sun stub here. Um, and this looks like this, and it's normally short, all right? I mean, we try to make them small, as short as possible for, for conductor losses. And then you wanna put another one next to it. First of all, if it's serious stub, you cannot put it, all right, in microstrip. But if we, let's assume it was a shunt stub. And how would you put it? You cannot put it on the same side because it would be just a thicker stub, all right? So. You cannot do something like this and then, oops. You cannot do in microstrip. I mean, give me more space. You cannot do in microstrip something like this. Why? because there is so coupling, so much coupling between these two that they behave like one if they're too close. And for them to not be coupled, they have to be farther away. And if they are farther away, then you have a section of a line that is gonna change your circuit. So um, if you put them like this, then this section of the line is going to introduce its own impact and it's going to, not going to be controlled because you know then you do it arbitrarily. So you cannot do this thing here and you cannot do that without the specific design of the length and that's what we do here. The other thing you cannot do in a microstrip is to do something like that. Because that by itself, um, if the length is, that length is close to half a wavelength, then, or even close to one third or one fourth of the wavelength, then this is gonna radiate like an antenna, like a dipole. And so you're gonna have a lot of losses from here, it usually radiates like this. So you do it only if you have very short stubs. So the total here is very short in some cases. But I would say for now for you, the, try to stay away from stacking stubs one on top of the other, okay? All right, so now um, we are going, what are we gonna do? Be very specific on how we replace stubs and, and how we, what we replace them with. So here, what Carlotta transformations are telling you is that you replace stubs 
uh, you replace capacity elements by stabs. And if your stab has a length of lambda c over eight, then practically what you see as an input impedance is nothing else. Let me in fact use a different one, use yellow. I'll use a different to see it. Look at this one. So if you use a stab which is an eighth of the wavelength, then your input impedance, whatever the reactance rather that you see in this stab is equivalent to the characteristic impedance of the line that makes this stab. So practically that's an easy rule. One eighth of a line at that design frequency is gonna give you a reactance whose value, exclude the J, is gonna be equal to um, the characteristic impedance of the line. So practically, I can immediately design, like shows here, to replace a capacitor, I can design a, an eighth of a wavelength of a shunt stub that is open at the end. For a series, it has to be short. For if it's, if it's series, short gives you J times the characteristic impedance of the line as an input reactance of a shunt and open lambda C over eight will give you an, an uh, susceptance there, which is like equal J included to the char characteristic admittance of the line. Okay, so practically now what we have done with this and I will skip the steps because we talked about that is to create this one here. And I will leave you with the following thought. If you apply exactly the transformations and this is 3.3 .3 here, all right? It's not 33, let me clean this up. Okay, if you apply the transformations, you see something that is already problematic. First of all, this is 500 ohms. The characteristic impedance of this red ZOS, it has to be 500 ohms. This is huge. The other one is very low, but it's okay. 31 ohms is not that bad compared to 50. But if you have a line like this, a microstrip line, this thick on one substrate, for example, and looks like that, and it's 50 ohms, then a line, a line that is gonna be 500 ohms on the same substrate is gonna be very narrow to give you that kind of characteristic impedance. Why is that? Why is gonna be so narrow? Because Z naught is the square root of L over C. All right, same thing here. Z naught square root of L over C. The wider the microstrip, the higher the capacitance. Or the, the, the more narrow the microstrip like this, like a dot practically, the lower the capacitance, which gives a higher impedance. But what happens when you have two narrow lines that the conductor loss is gonna be very high? So very narrow microstrip lines increase here the conductor loss. So very narrow lines are out of the question. Not appropriate. So what we're gonna do next time, we're gonna see how to change this, how to avoid this problem. These are all very important and will help you in your project because today for, a, I'll give you two weeks 
today for the next project, you're gonna, I will ask you to use whatever you see from here to use MicroStrip to create the filters that you need in, for your project, whatever filters. Now you have the capability, do the simple, don't go out of your way to do extreme things. That's what I would like to suggest you. Even if you are to use MATLAB or something else, try to be as simple as possible. The simplest solutions are the best solutions. You need to keep that in mind. So these, uh, these important considerations, I will continue with this next time, especially for MicroStrip are important when you start this deciding how to deal with these dimensions. Now you need to remember these are design problems. In design problems, there is not only one solution. This is mathematically a correct solution. But if you were to make it and try to implement it, a filter like that will have higher losses from another filter that will have better um, characteristic impedances. 210 is already high, but not unacceptable. 500 is way out. So we'll talk about this next time. Any questions? All right, thank you so much. I will see, uh, we'll stay here at three for office hours. Join me if you want. Thank you.